Okay, this is probably going to be one of the hardest 10 minute videos, but we're going to do um, a video about cognitive dissonance and we're going to maintain our historical perspective. Uh, the definition of cognitive dissonance, it refers to a situation involving conflicting attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors, and this produces a feeling of discomfort leading to an alteration to one of the attitudes, belief, beliefs, or behaviors to reduce the discomfort and restore balance. And that basically is um, when you have a belief of one thing, but your actions are in conflict to what you're saying you believe, so you alter or rationalize why you're doing it to make everything back in line, saying, okay, I believe in being a Christian and I function under the Bible as that book of law and doctrine that governs my behavior. But if I am a slave owner, that conflicts with my quote unquote book of law. So I have to rationalize why I can do what it is I want to do and still maintain my Christian um Christian uh, alignment with the Bible. Now, that's just an example of slavery. Cognitive dissonance is about anything that your belief system and your activities don't align. Um, the, co the example of the cognitive dissonance uh, with slavery was that they made, they dehumanized the African and made the African less than a person. So they became chattel. They were a thing. So I'm not functioning against God's creatures in a way that is inconsistent with the Bible. So that's the cognitive dissonance that, all right, I have to come up with a reason as to why it's okay for what I did. In fact, I had a, a class the other night and we were talking about Andrew Jackson and it was two books. Uh, two of them I've done, um, one of them I did, the Wilentz book. I believe I've already done a book review video on. And Wilentz loves, um, loves Andrew Jackson and referred to Schlesinger's book, Age, The Age of Jackson, a lot. And both of them were uh, Jacksonians, if uh, to, for lack of a better term. They really felt that the, the good Jackson brought the country and bringing democracy into white America, white male America was so great that it overrode the um, atrocities against the Native American and the slaves, now American blacks. And as we were discussing these things, it was, um, it came up that that was a very hard, uh, issue to go around as to where Schlesinger just didn't address uh, Andrew Jackson's activity in slavery and Native American removal and um, that Wilentz tried to rationalize it, which basically just gave him a pass. It's a good book. If you had the opportunity, it's a big book. It's a thousand pages, but it's a good book to read, even if you're reading it not to share the perspective, but to entertain the thought and understand how people unlike you think. And a good example of that was a student in the class had said um, that they didn't feel that Jackson's activity against Native Americans was that severe. And he, him being president removed him from the Trail of Tears, he was just functioning with legislation. And I had pointed out to that student that uh, Jackson was known for slave removal way before he was president. Uh, in fact, when he was in the military, he did that. And that's how he became one of the largest slave owners because of stolen Indian land. And I could see cognitive dissonance going on right there in front of me 
as to where she was rationalizing how a military person is functioning under orders and that they uh, are not necessarily responsible for their activity. And at the end of the day, we all are responsible for our activity. Even if we have to say, I was wrong, we are responsible for it. But that was an example of it today as to where we can rationalize some of the most heinous activity away. And unfortunately, when we rationalize it, we normalize it. Further, I am um, reading a book by, and I will do a separate book review, but John Thornton's Africa and Africans in the Making of the Atlantic World, 1400 to 1650. And there is also a second edition that goes to 1800. In this book, it's hard to have words for. This book was uh, published as recently, I believe, as 2000, but definitely 1998, same thing. And this book is a mass of, con of, um, of cognitive dissonance. It is explaining that Africans were an active part in chattel slavery and that Africans were not stripped of their culture during the Middle Passage and upon arriving in colonial settlements. If we just take black people in the United States. We don't speak an African language. We don't have African names. We have very little African uh, knowledge. So to say that is really, really, that's, that's cognitive dissonance. It's where you are removing the dynamics of what happened. This person also said in their book that slavery wasn't that bad. Said, you know, uh, self-sustaining slave communities remain. remain. How could a self-sustaining slave community be, that's an oxymoron. Slaves didn't own anything. They could not sustain themselves because they didn't, they weren't educated. They had no resources. They did not own themselves. They didn't even own their own labor. They were less than the proletariat. So it, it's almost a grotesque attempt at we weren't the only bad people as opposed to saying this is what we did. It's, well, these people were bad too. Why are they getting a pass kind of situation? And... Um, in, 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 he, he had several points. The book is dividing it, divided into two parts, and one is explaining the economy of Africa and Europe, Europe because what he wants to, what he wanted to uh, discredit was the fact that Africa, Africa was forced into the participation in chattel slavery and the slave trade by way of an economic dependency on European trade. And he was saying how, how, uh, how great the African economy was independent of the Europeans. And it's funny that we get compliments when they're trying to fix something that doesn't look good on them. So that, so if, you know, in most of our readings, they were underdeveloped and needed to be taken over. Now, I don't understand how Africa was colonized and controlled by Europeans. The colonies in North America is colonized and controlled by Europeans, but there was no pressure in control completely by Europeans. So there was something that was going on that offered a degree of pressure if Africa ended up being controlled by Europeans and 
the slaves that were colonized. But the first part of the book is talking about that relationship. It's describing the region, the relationships between um, Africa and Europe, and Europe. And the second half of the book is the process of enslavement and the slave trade. And his logic behind the fact that culture was uh, African culture was not removed during the Middle Passage and upon arriving to um, the colonies is based on, well, there's still African culture here. So basically, if they weren't stripped 100%, then they couldn't have been stripped at all. It's it's a book that I definitely recommend people to read just so you can see how now cognitive dissonance plays a great part in our society and hand in hand with that, hand in hand with racism is a huge hurdle to overcome. And I will get back to this video as far as the book review of uh, Africa, Africans, and the making of the Atlantic world.